Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I am James Barty, Washington. Today is Wednesday, March the 1st, and here are some of the stories we are covering. Nigerian opposition groups protest early presidential results. The coalition is fraudulent, is false, because we have seen cases, many cases, where people are disenfranchised. INEC materials arrived late in many places where thousands of people had already left. Viewers Peter Clotty on assignment in Nigeria will bring us the latest. We will also hear from a member of the National Peace Committee of Nigeria. Uganda's parliament aims to pass an anti-LGBTQ law. Meanwhile, Kenya's Supreme Court says the gay, lesbian and transgender community has a right of association. The actions of homosexuality can never be acceptable. They are evil and must be addressed as so. And a South African solar powered cinema inspires African youth. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Nigerian opposition groups have called Saturday's presidential election a sham that should be overturned as their supporters protest in the capital, Abuja. The Electoral Commission says ballots show ruling party candidate Bola Ahmed Tinubu in the lead. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja. About 100 protesters, mostly women and youth, chanted as they held up placards less than 600 meters away from the National Collation Center in Abuja. Barricades set up by security forces blocked them from getting closer to the venue where Nigeria's Electoral Commission, INEC, announced the results of last weekend's presidential elections for a third day. As of late Tuesday, INEC had announced full results from two-thirds of Nigeria's 36 states. The candidate for the ruling All Progressives Congress, or APC party, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, led the race with more than 7 million votes. Tinubu was followed by Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party, who had over 6 million votes, and Peter Obi of the Labour Party with more than 5 million. But protesters like Moses Paul say the results have been manipulated. The results, the coalition is fraudulent, is false, because we have seen cases, many cases, where people are disenfranchised. Uh, INEC materials arrived late in many places where thousands of people had already left. Ballots were snatched. Certain political groups told other political groups to get out. The election was marked by widespread delays, operational issues with the voting machines, violence and coercion in some areas. Many observers, including the EU mission, had said the voting lacked transparency and fell below expectations. On Monday, 10 political party representatives walked out of the collation center after calling for the vote count to be suspended alleging irregularities and discrepancies. INEC refused to do so. Supporters of the ruling APC, like Shola Lawal, also protested in Abuja saying INEC must be allowed to complete the process. INEC has have done well in the process. If you had such evidence, audiovisual evidence of violence, of destruction, it's very, very minute, too minute to affect the outcome of this election. This is the first time INEC has used the bimodal voter accreditation system in a national election. The system, in theory, allows for real-time monitoring and uploading of results from the polling units to INEC's server, but in most cases, that did not happen. European Union Chief Observer Barry Andrews spoke to VOA Monday about the mission's preliminary observations. The technology uh, that promised so much did not meet expectations. Uh, There were significant problems about uploading results. There were problems at Vivas, um, recognition, facial recognition and fingerprint evidence. There was a lack of security in the configuration of polling booths. So, uh, unfortunately, this served to undermine the trust and integrity of, in the integrity of the electoral process. Final results of the presidential and parliamentary elections are not expected for at least another two days. As more results are announced, experts say tensions may increase across Nigeria. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria.
Vote counting continued into Tuesday night following Nigeria's presidential parliamentary and gubernatorial elections on Saturday. According to the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, the latest results as of Tuesday night showed the ruling all-progressive Congress party candidate Bola Tinibu with 8.2 million votes, Atiku Abubakar of main opposition People's Democratic Party, the PDP, with 6.9 million ballots cast, and Peter Obi of the Labour Party with 6.1 million. Meanwhile, according to local media, Tinubu has gone to court to prevent opposition parties from stopping the coalition process. This, as some opposition parties have called on INEC to cancel Saturday's election and announce a new date for a new election. On the line from Abuja, Nigeria, is viewers Peter Clotty, who is on assignment covering the Nigerian vote. There's tension in the air after three opposition political parties. You're talking about the main opposition, People's Democratic Party, the Labour Party, and a party called ADC held a joint press conference calling on the INEC chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, to step down for failing to what they described as organized, transparent, free, and credible elections. They said that the promises and guidelines I made outlined before the elections were not followed, creating the avenue for people to tamper with the results of the elections from the various polling stations across the country. This was because approximately 80% of the system put in place to electronically transmit the election results from the polling stations to the Beavers or the election portal of the Electoral Commission was not done. Supposedly, an order was given not to be done for about three, four, five, up to six hours before some of the results were collated. The opposition group say that is enough time for people to tamper with the election results. Peter, as we speak, I am looking at the live uh, 2023 elections uh, website. As things stand, I mean, are they still announcing results even though the call has been made for the election to be postponed? Indeed, the Electoral Commission is barreling ahead with the coalition of the results here in Abuja at the International Coalition Center or the Conference Center here in Abuja. The Electoral Commission has not responded to calls for the chairperson to step down. Interestingly, the ruling party also held a competing press conference to rebut calls for the INEX chairman to step down or for the elections to be scrapped. They are saying that the electoral process has laid down guidelines which must be followed. If you don't agree with the outcome of the elections, you go to court. Suppose the Elections Commission continues to announce results and there is a decisive winner. What do you think might happen? Well, you know, some people are even predicting that there could be a runoff. Now, we don't know that yet because up till now, uh, they have only uh, about 16, 17 states that have been announced so far. Now, Nigeria has 36 states, so it's even unlikely for us to know who might come up top. So now it remains to be seen what will happen. But from all indications, it's a little bit too early to determine who will come out tops at the moment. Peter, thank you so much for the wonderful coverage you provided us. We do appreciate it very much. Thank you very much, James. That was me, Peter Clotty, speaking with us from the Nigerian capital, Abuja. In Nigeria, a member of the National Peace Committee says it is important for citizens to remain calm as the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, navigates the various landmines that plagued last Saturday's elections. The National Peace Committee was able to get all 18 presidential candidates to sign agreements to denounce violence and incitement during and after the vote. Roman Catholic Bishop Matthew Kuka of the Sokoto Diocese says he believes the presidential candidates have so far been calm, although their spokespersons have been vocal about irregularities. Bishop Kuka tells me the challenge is for INEC to deliver to Nigerians results that are free, fair, and credible. This is an election that we are all very excited about, very passionate about, and it is the first and in the history of our nation that we've had the very passionate involvement of uh, the majority of the population, namely young people. And I think by and large, that enthusiasm 
was manifested in the fact that Nigerians were so willing to make so much sacrifices to go out and ask their votes. The challenge now is with the collecting and the announcement of the results and so on and so forth. There have been some people who are calling for the postponement or the cancellation of the election itself, let alone the counting of the ballots. What do you think of that? You know, I mean, we cannot take a binary position, in part because what we're dealing with is a very, very complicated phase of our history. These elections are very, very, very important. Indeed, like any elections, especially in developing countries such as ours. We've got a lot of things that went from the spread of violence to voter suppression manifested in different ways. The challenge, therefore, is for the electoral body to now walk through this, what I may call this landmine, and deliver to the people of Nigeria results that are credible and seem to be evidence of an election that was free, fair, and credible. I think that is really where we are at now. It's not so much about should the election be cancelled or should they not be cancelled. It is how do we reach a threshold of accountability delivered by the electoral empire to ordinary Nigeria and the international community that shows very clearly that whoever is declared winner of the elections will not be holding a tainted prize. Bishop, you mentioned you are a member of the National Peace Council. Prior to the election, all 18 presidential candidates signed a peace accord that the council put together. What do you think should be the role of the other candidates in terms of maintaining peace and stability? You know, the presidential candidates signed two peace accords. The first peace accord that was signed in September was for them to commit themselves to conducting their campaigns in the most civil manner. And then the second signing of the peace accord, which happened last week, was for them to sign on to accepting the results of the elections. As long as the the elections are seen to be free, fair, and credible, those are the operational words. So that's where we are now. And I think in fairness to the presidential candidates themselves, it is likely they are spokesmen and women that are making quite a lot of incendiary statements. But for the candidates, I think on balance, the candidates have behaved themselves. Bishop Kuka, thank you so much. A pleasure to speak with you always. Thank you. So good to talk to you too. Matthew Kuka is the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese and a member of the National Peace Committee of Nigeria. You are speaking with me from Sokoto. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on The Voice of America. I am James Barty, Washington. Today is Wednesday, March 1st. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The churches and the Council of Imams in Kenya have condemned last week's Supreme Court ruling that the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer LGBTQ community have the right to association. Religious leaders said the ruling goes against the cultural beliefs of Kenya. Already, the Member of Parliament, Peter Kaluma, has written to the Speaker of the National Assembly informing him of his intention to introduce a bill in Parliament that will criminalize same-sex acts. Maureen Ojiambo reports. A majority of the Supreme Court judges said that previous decisions by the lower courts to deny the members of the gay community in Kenya of their right to register as a non-governmental organization NGO were discriminatory. The Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church, Antony Moheria, faults the Supreme Court for going against a Kenyan law that characterizes same-sex relations as illegal. If this association is so as to spread, popularize, and bring about more and more people into this kind of actions and behavior, then we call it out as evil. The actions of homosexuality can never be acceptable. They are evil and must be addressed as so. The push to register the community started in 2013 when the National Gay and Lesbians Human Rights Commission sought to have the Non-Governmental Organization Coordination Board reserve a name out of the list of the advancement of their rights. The suggested names were National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission, National Coalition of Gays and Lesbians in Kenya, among others. The board, however, declined, saying the names were not acceptable. 
Homa Bay Town Member of Parliament Peter Kaluma has vowed to challenge the Supreme Court ruling. So we are going back to the Supreme Court to remind the Supreme Court that in as much as we keep talking about human rights and fundamental rights, those rights are limited under Article 24 of the Constitution. So by my law, I'm seeking not only to increase the sentence, but also to ensure that that wide array of people, including law enforcement agencies, are held culpable whenever they fail to, 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 to enforce the law. Section 165 of the Kenyan Constitution prohibits same-sex relationships and homosexuality marriages cannot be ordained in the country. The practices are referred to as against the order of nature and can lead to up to 14 years in prison. Kenya Senate Majority Leader Aaron Cheriot has termed the ruling absurd. There is a serious contradiction in the fact that you cannot tell me that what I'm engaged in is an illegality as per the laws of the land, but then go ahead to grant me the opportunity to caucus and have a union of the same illegality. We believe that marriage is a union between a man and a woman. Anything else is strange and not an acceptable practice in our country. Deputy Chief Justice Philomena Mwilu, Justice Moken Wanjala, and Justice Njoki Ndungu expressed the decision of the majority on the issue saying, and I quote, it would be unconstitutional to limit the right to associate through denial of registration of an association purely based on sexual orientation of the applicants. On the opposing side, Justice Mohammed Ibrahim and William Ouko said that the LGBTQ individual should not be allowed to form recognized associations in Kenya as it is against the country's laws. Kimani Shungwa is a majority leader of Kenya's National Assembly. We are not in any way in the near future going to be reviewing those laws. I think uh, we are also African, we have our own cultures. We shall not allow our cultures to be mutilated by cultures that that are alien to us. Most members of the community in Kenya claim they do not feel safe following an online backlash and attacks. The National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission issued a statement saying action needs to be taken against individuals and groups spreading hate speech and inciting violence against LGBTQ individuals. Jerry Gateru is the executive director of the commission. All these decisions just basically referencing that um, all persons in Kenya are considered and protected under the Constitution, and particularly that um, human rights are inalienable, therefore sexual orientation cannot be used as a basis of limiting people's rights in Kenya, and particularly the right to form and register an, an association. Dr. Emi Kageha is an associate research scientist at African Population and Health Research Center on matters of importance to the LGBTQ community. She says same-sex relations are criminalized in Kenya and that lesbian, gay and transgender Kenyans need to be protected from groups who do not accept their lifestyle and wish to harm them. The ruling will now give the LGBTQ community the power to seek formal recognition by the Non-Governmental Organization Coordination Board and ensure that constitutional rights apply to everyone, even to unpopular minorities. Reporting for VOS Daybreak Africa, I am Moreno Jambo in Sacramento, California. The Ugandan parliament is set to deliberate and pass a law that criminalizes same-sex relations. Many legislators call homosexuality a cancer that goes against African traditional beliefs and cultures. But one activist said the law will encroach on privacy and personal freedoms. Reporter Mugumi Davis Rakarinji has more from Kampala. The Uganda Parliament Tuesday unanimously passed a resolution granting leave of office to draft a law, the Anti Homosexuality Bill 2023, that criminalizes acts directed the LGBTQ community in the country. Parliamentarian Asuman Basalua termed homosexuality a cancer in society. Basalua is a legislator from Bujini Municipality. It is common knowledge that homosexuality has become a cancer. In this country or in this world, we talk about human rights, but it is also true that there are human wrongs. I want to submit right from speaker that homosexuality is a human wrong that needs to be tackled through a piece of legislation. In 2014, the parliament passed a similar law that was later overturned by the Constitutional Court. Speaker of Parliament and Tamong called on legislators to unite and pass the law. Today, the vice has persisted 
the people who are suffering are our children. The people who are suffering are you and me. The Western world is saying they're assisting us. We don't want their assistance. Let this parliament stand up and be counted. Richard Lusimbu, the director of Uganda Key Populations Consortium, a local rights organization. He says banning sexual activity between consenting adults goes against both domestic and international rights. Criminalizing same-sex relationships would be discriminatory. It would also infringe on the right to privacy, which protects individuals from interference in their private lives. Instead, MP should be focusing on promoting and protecting the human rights of all citizens, including LGBT individuals. He's calling on members of parliament to instead repeal all laws that discriminate against sexual minorities. Political and religious leaders have in recent days condemned LGBT activities, saying they're against African culture and go against nature. Human rights activists say such activity is found in nature and has always existed in society, though often taboo and sometimes violently repressed. For VOA News, I am Mugume, Davis Rwakarinji Kampala, Uganda. A South African group is bringing films to African youth in impoverished areas with poor services through solar power portable cinemas. The group Sunshine Cinema is in four countries but aims to inspire more youth on the continent through African films. Zahir Kasim reports from Pankop, South Africa. Like most villages in South Africa, Pankop has little access to power or the internet. Watching a film is a rare treat from aid group Sunshine Cinema, which brings a solar-powered movie projector and speaker to poor remote areas. The group also provides jobs to operators like Larata Atlawa, who says the African films they select are not about entertaining, but inspiring. After viewing a movie, you realize, hmm, the way I might have been doing things might have been a little bit offish or might have been wrong. And then it changes your perspective drastically to say, I can actually be a better person in my community. I can actually go out there and be the change in my community. South Africa's government says nearly two-thirds of youth under 24 are jobless, raising the temptation of crime, especially among young men. A boys' mentorship program hosted today's film, Riding with Sugar, a South African film that tackles the issue of xenophobia. 21-year-old Offense Mekwa says the film was inspiring. Events like this are important because they help us to know which part of the future we want to be a part of. A future whereby we can eliminate all racism, all xenophobic attacks on foreigners, you know, and we just want to be a better version of humanity. Sunshine Cinema, which runs on donations, started a decade ago in South Africa, but has since spread to neighboring Zimbabwe, Zambia and Malawi. They are ready to expand further across Africa, says co-founder Sadal Willow-Smith. We would love to expand into other African countries. We believe that we have a model that can really work because we are addressing youth unemployment at the same time as working in distribution. The young people that go through our program receive rigorous training and impact facilitation. So they're coming out of this program with a lot of soft skills as well as a lot of skills that can be transferred into the workplace. Sunshine Cinema says their goal is to spark conversations about issues that affect Africans. They also offer an online course for anyone in a developing country with scholarships for those who cannot afford it on how to use media for impact. For remote communities like Pankop, the impact of the solar-powered cinema is to bring hope for a better world. Zahir Kasim for VOA News, Pankop, South Africa. Human Rights Watch said Tuesday Tunisian authorities should immediately reinstate judges and prosecutors that President Kai Saeed has dismissed as part of his anti-corruption campaign. The Justice Minister has refused to reinstate 49 magistrates despite an administrative court order in August to do so, a ruling that Human Rights Watch says authorities cannot appeal. Instead, the Justice Minister announced the preparation of criminal cases against the dismissed judges. 
In 2021, Saeed said he would take over supervision of public prosecution and, as a part of his war against corruption, unilaterally dissolved the High Judicial Council, a constitutional body that guarantees the independence of the judiciary. Today, its members are appointed, including nine directly by the president. And that's it for this Wednesday, March 1st edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for coming aboard with us this morning. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at VOA Africa. Dot com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa crew, I am James Brown.